We all remember her heartbreaking story. She left her son in the car for one moment and now cannot forgive herself. I'm looking at my car driving away and my son dragging alongside of it. I cannot believe that I just stopped for one second and, you know, my life is done. There's just no purpose. Can she find her way back? Can she find the courage to forgive herself? Somehow, this mother did. I dozed off at the wheel. I can remember looking up and saying, I've killed my children. It was a long, dark tunnel before we started to find joy, but we did find it. Finding the courage to forgive yourself. Coming up. Oh, big, big, big. Oh. <laughs> Everybody. If you are a mom, you're going to find this to be a very powerful show. You will look at your children differently from this day forward. I am sure one of the most powerful lessons we have learned from the book uh, Tuesdays with Maury, which so many of you read and a lot of you saw the film that we did, is this, that it's not just other people we need to forgive, Maury said, but we also need to learn to forgive ourselves. How do you do that? Uh, for Christy Robel, uh, being able to forgive herself seems impossible. Uh, for those of you who are dealing with it in other areas of your life, uh, this will be important for you to hear because it's something that she struggles with every minute of every day since witnessing the horrifying death of her six-year-old son, Jake, earlier this year. Listen to this. Six-year-old Jake Robel was belted safely in the backseat of his mom's car, heading home. He told his mom, Christy, he was thirsty, so she stopped at a sandwich shop to get him a drink. Jake didn't want to go in, so she left him buckled in the backseat and ran in for just a minute. A fatal decision. A man who had been released from prison just hours earlier saw the car with the keys left inside. He seized the opportunity. Christy had just barely made it in the door when she raced out to confront the carjacker who was already inside her car and backing out of the parking lot. She reached inside the back seat to try to free her son from his seatbelt and pull him out. <laughs> I tried so hard to get him out. Christy grabbed Jake, but the seatbelt was looped around his waist. She was holding him as tight as she could, but was eventually forced to let go as a carjacker sped away in her vehicle with her son dangling out the door. I had my son in my arms, and my legs were like just dragging on, on the pavement. And he just gunned it. And when he gunned it, I let go. And I just watched him drag. <laughs> Motorists watched in horror as the stolen vehicle dragged the little boy to his death. You could see it was a small child, five or six years old, and it was like a little rag doll just bouncing. Jake was dragged for five miles at speeds over 80 miles an hour. You don't expect it to happen to you, and when it does, you just, you, it's unreal. He was the best kid in the whole world. It's hard to watch, hard to hear. But imagine if that happened to you. It has been almost a year. It was February 22nd when this happened of this year, 2000, uh, since Jake's death. And Christy knows that she needs to start moving on, forgiving herself for what happened, but says she doesn't know how. When I walked away from the car that day, I wasn't thinking anything bad could happen. I was shaking and screaming. I'm looking at my car driving away and my son dragging alongside of it thinking, he can't be alive. He can't endure that. I knew that I would never see him again. I cannot believe that I just stopped for one second and, you know, my life is done, basically. One second. I know that I wasn't doing anything different than any other mom or dad does in a daily routine to turn your back from your child. Parents do it every day when they go to answer the phone or they leave the house to go get the mail. But just in making a bad judgment call, it's hard to forgive yourself. 
And the only reason that I have to is because my judgment call ended in my son's death. Definitely the first week, month was shock, disbelief. And then I remember a downtime where everybody went back to work and life went on. And I was sitting there by myself thinking, I can't do this. You know, I can't do this by myself. There's just no purpose to just wake up every day and think, okay, how am I gonna do this? Inside, it's hell. And when I talk to him, I can lay in my bed and I can say, I hope that, that you forgive me, you know? Um, I hope you're not mad at me. I want peace. And I feel like that if I ask him, then it's better. Because I can say, you know, that I was good to you. I don't know how to forgive myself. My guilt comes from me making a decision that I made all the time and something bad happening from my decision. And still to this day, I can be driving in my car and just think, he's really not here. I cannot believe that me, a good mom, a very good mom who loved her child, he's not here. There's no gray area. He is not here. And if I would have done something different, he would be. So we share this story with you because I know that there are millions of you moms out there who are really, really good people who have done the same thing many, many times in your life. Because if you heard the beginning of that story, Christy said that Jake said, Mom, I'm thirsty. So she was stopping at the store to get him something to drink, trying to be a good mom, not waiting until they got home um, for his benefit. And um, you said that when you ran out of the store, like so many other people do, for a moment, it's a moment's time, it never occurred to you that the man wouldn't stop so that you could get your son out of the car. Never. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that when somebody had told me somebody was getting in my car, I, I was completely in control. I thought that anybody in their right frame of mind would see me coming and stop mm -hmm. and run or... But he didn't, he continued. Like he didn't hear me, like he didn't see me, like I was not there. And by the time you're trying to get Jake out of the uh, seatbelt, by the time you're doing that, he recognizes that. Because I thought when I first heard the story, the last time we were here, when you were telling, I thought, well, maybe he didn't know there was a child in the back. But then obviously he did, because you're, you're wrestling, trying to get your son oh, yeah. out of the seatbelt to yes. loosen him, and he pulled off. Yeah, I was, I was in the back seat trying mm -hmm. to get screaming, mm -hmm. you know, let me just get him undone and you can have my car. You can have anything, just let me get him out of the back seat. And he was, he was not even paying attention, just mm -hmm. like n didn't matter, he wanted the car. So, you know, logically, I guess you can understand, and those of us who are listening to you, which I am horrified of the hate mail that you received the last time you were here. I'm horrified that people would write to you and say what a bad mom you were. Mm -hmm. I'm ashamed of people for doing that. Just ashamed. Dated one day after he was killed. Yeah, I think that's horrible. I think that's horrible. Uh, because it could happen to anybody. Right. And, and this was the mother who yeah, wrote this. Yeah, that she would. Anyway, um, when, when this happened to you, logically, you understand that it is not your fault. Logically, you right. do logically right. understand that you were not a bad person and this was not your fault. So what is it that you, you can't forgive? You can't forgive the moment, you can't forgive the fact that you stopped for the drink. I can't forgive that I didn't act more rationally, that I didn't stop and think, what can you do? I just... But my, what could you have done? I don't know. I, I, don't, I could have let him take my car and the cops could have found him and taken him out of the car, and I could have just... You mean not try to get him yeah, out of the car? Yeah, not try to get him out, because I think me trying to get him out is, mm -hmm. what, is what led to his dying, because he would not have been outside of the car. Would have been half I, in, half out. Right, had I not tried to get him out, if I would have just left him alone and, and let the 
policemen do what they needed to do to get him. But... Well, then perhaps then he never would have been discovered. He would have taken the car. He would have done whatever to your son. He would have, you know, realized that, here, I have a child now, and what am I going to do with this child? Right. I mean, yeah. and that's the thing. I, I always tell myself, well, if you would have done that, he, you might have never seen him again. That's right, he because might've... what made him be noticeable is that your son is hanging out the car. Right, yeah. right. But, but that's, that's the main thing, is that I just wish I would have done something different. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, just something to where he would be alive. Next, how you began the process of uh, forgiving yourself and shedding the burden of guilt and blame. When we come back, we'll be back. So we have seen on this show the power of forgiveness, but often it can be more difficult to forgive yourself Imagine if you felt that you were responsible for the death of your child. And that's harder to forgive than forgiving other people. So many people are imprisoned in their own guilt and self-blame for something not as devastating as this and can't move forward in their lives. So our goal on this show today is to help you take those teeny first steps to begin to forgive yourself. We've been talking to Christy about the guilt she lives with every single day after w witnessing the horrific death. And we all admit that's about, as, that's bad. That is, I don't, can't imagine anything worse than that, I'm sure. Uh, uh, Rabbi Irvin Kula uh, teaches and lectures throughout the United States. And he says that the first thing that Christy has to realize, and all of us who are hearing this, is that forgiveness does not mean getting over it, correct? Right. I mean, before, before we even get there, um, I just saw this tape for the first time about 20 minutes ago before here. And, and the first thing to say, Christy, is, is the unbelievable amount of courage to come here and tell this story. Because if this show ended right this moment, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who've already been helped just because you're willing to tell the story. So before I even get into how we begin to start forgiving ourselves, you're already starting. Right? You're already starting or you wouldn't be here. Now, you may not know that yet, but you're already starting. Mm -hmm. Because the first thing is to, is to understand that, that forgiving you begin to move, not from what the past was like and that we can change the past, but what do I do right now? Well, someone made a call and said, can you come on this show? And you decided yes. And that's a, something that you actually could control because you could have said no. And I think every single person here would have understood if you said no. Mm -hmm but you didn't, you said yes. That is already uh, witnessing the healing. Now, it doesn't mean you feel it yet. It doesn't mean you feel it. You may not feel it for, for a long time to come, but it's a shift from what if to what next. And, you know, I said this on a show that Gary Zukav was on. We were talking about the woman who'd lost her one of her twins, and it only was one and a half pounds and only lived for three days. And there we were also moved by that story. And I was saying to Christy during the commercial break, already Jake has had a very big life. The six years that he lived, for everybody, every one of us who was hearing this story, and for every one of you moms out there who has heard this today, and many of you who wrote us who heard it uh, when Christy was on here earlier in the year, who's going to change your behavior with your own children. Mm -hmm. That is the spirit of Jake living on. Right. See, part of, part of what the whole healing and part of what forgiving is about is moving from uh, thinking about it as a head thing to, thinking of, to, to feeling it as a heart thing. You can't think your way into feeling forgiven. You can't do that because there's always what ifs. But you can feel your way into that step by step because in the end, forgiveness is an intuition about who you are. It's not oh, you see, I proved A, B, C, D, E, F, now I'm, I'm forgiven. And it's beginning to recognize that there are lessons here, even though you don't want, you wish, we all wish, you didn't have to learn any of the le lessons because of the event. It's not a cause. It's not that you learn something and you say, oh, okay, now I understand why this happened. No, we don't need to understand why it happened. The lessons impose the meaning. So, so Oprah, you already have one lesson that emerges that somehow, somehow, and it's not, it's not that it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Nothing's worth it. Because she just wants her son back. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and intellectually, obviously, understands that is not going to happen. But I heard, heard you say that you will always be his mother. You just will not be able to mother him. Right. Physically. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and that in, in itself isn't, isn't really enough for me because I feel lucky to mm -hmm. have been his mom. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and a lot of people, that's one thing that it, it's hard for people. This to, was her only child, too. It's hard for people to, t to talk to me and, you know, to really know what to say. Mm -hmm. And I think when, when they find out, oh, oh, you were his mom, they immediately change their tune. Mm -hmm. It's now pity. Mm -hmm. When his life wasn't pitiful, his right. life was wonderful. Yeah. Pity what happened, that was disgusting. Mm -hmm. But he was an incredible child. Yeah, because they now think that that is your entire life. Right. Talking about him and either not being able to mention his name and saying nothing or every time saying his name. And I think part of it is understanding your life is bigger than that moment. Your life is bigger than your son's death. Right. right. Yeah, a, and his life was bigger than his death. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between the event itself and mm -hmm. everything that follows the event. In other words, there is nothing, nothing now and, and there's nothing more tragic than this. And, and we all know you would do anything, anything. And you've thought of more things to do to try to change the past than anyone here can possibly imagine. But what you know is you can't change the past, but what you have absolute control over, and, and this, is, this is the first stage of beginning a healing process, is to understand what you do have control of. You have absolute control of this moment, right now. What you're going to say, what you're not going to say, right? Whether a feeling is going to paralyze you or not paralyze you, you have absolute control so now. So what you're saying is she needs to say what next and what not next? what if. Right. Because what if is living in the past. Yeah, that's big. The power of healing often comes from the knowledge that you're not alone in your pain. When we come back, a mother who fell asleep at the wheel, resulting in the death of three of her children. How she found the strength to forgive herself. We'll be right back. So Rabbi Kula was saying to Christy, and I think this is really important for everybody who is going through this, you know, not to live in the what if, because the what if is the past, and you recognize that that cannot be changed, but what next? What else does she need to do? I think... That's easier said than yeah, done. Every, everything here is easier said than because done. Because I know you've what ifed yourself crazy. A million times. A million times. Yeah. What if? What if? I mean, right. Five years from now, it'll be a lot easier to talk about this. Uh, I think a second thing that's, that's very important is is to understand that feeling guilty is not a bad thing. And the culture keeps telling us, don't feel guilty, don't feel guilty, don't feel guilty. And I'm sure people have come to you and say, you have nothing to feel guilty about. You did everything you can, <clears throat> everything you could. But, but in fact, that you feel guilty is a sign of being a moral person, a yeah. sign of being a responsible yeah. person. Of having remorse. Of having remorse, right. of, yes. of being a decent person. Now mm -hmm. the only question is, there's guilt and there's excessive guilt. But... But if you try to do away and resist the feeling of guilt, well, you know, anything that you resist stays there and becomes even stronger. So you don't right. want to resist the guilt. What you want to do is, in a way, ride it and understand that it's not you. It's didn't you, didn't you have the, also the point of imagining what feeling better would feel like? But I imagine when you're, in the, when you're down there in the abyss, when you're there behind the veil, as a lot of people have been for themselves, that it's hard to even imagine what feeling better feels like. Are, are, are you there? Not really. Mm -hmm. Not That's really. good. Not really. Uh, Christy was just saying, too, that when she finds herself smiling, I know that there are many people who go this who have lost loved ones through, you know, other means, that you find yourself being happy and you end up feeling guilty for that or feel like other people, since now Christy's face is, is known throughout the country, other people look at you and say, what are you smiling for? It's, you should still be depressed, mm -hmm. you know? In bed. In bed. Yeah, why do you... Did your hair today? Why do you, you know, mm -hmm. it's, I, I don't understand. I can't lay in bed all day. Mm -hmm. I'd like to sometimes, mm -hmm. but that's not functioning. Mm -hmm. You know, my son wouldn't want me to be laying around and, and feeling bad and not doing anything. I have got to continue to live. Mm -hmm. Right, and you can't, what, one of the things that you've learned, you know, and, and that we've all learned is that is that what you can't control, you simply can't worry about. You cannot control someone else's responses. Just like you can't control the past. So you can't control the past. You really can't control the future. You can't control other people's responses, which is all hard to understand for us. But what you can control 100% is that moment. You can decide in the morning to get out of bed. Right. That you have absolute control. Can we talk over. about, of course, I was just, you know, I was, became emotional thinking about how horrifying it is, because I know what it's like to receive nasty mail, but to receive nasty mail for a tragedy such as this. And, I, and you were saying to us when I was saying, why would somebody have the nerve to sit in judgment of what she should have done 
and you shouldn't have left your son there, and you should have not. And you were saying it's because of people's own fear? Well, I mean, anybody that's going to act that inappropriately, right, it's more about them. Again, it's not about you. They don't know you. They never spoke to you. They don't know how you feel about anything. They don't even know what you look like. So it's not coming from anything having to do with you. It's coming from them. And, and you can imagine, we're all now, uh, we're saddened at this moment. Right? And, and, and many people here don't even know how to respond. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so from not knowing how to respond, you're going to have a full range, everything from the, 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 the real sickest, unhealthiest, crazy. crazy, good, the craziest responses. Crazy people. To the responses that are, that are, that are, that mean well. Right. That, that, that are off. Okay, let's talk about that uh, after we introduce our next guest, because, because uh, isn't it true you don't know what to do when something like this happens? You don't know what to do or what, what to, to say, say or what's appropriate or how you should be? We've seen over and over again on this show, however, how many people find comfort and strength from knowing they're not alone. I know of many of you who are watching Christy that we never knew your name are finding comfort in hearing her story because a similar thing has happened in your life. Well, Teresa Birch knows firsthand what it is like to feel responsible for your own child's death. She is sharing her story and the lessons she learned there in hopes of healing other mothers who are burdened with this same guilt. Like Christy, listen to Teresa's story. We had six little children. The oldest was seven. After a family vacation, Teresa was driving her children home to be with her husband, Richard. After several hours on the road, the lines on the highway seemed monotonous. All the kids had fallen asleep in the car, except for Ryan. I knew I was getting tired, but I didn't know it was getting that bad. Fighting sleep, Teresa planned to stop at the next area to take a break. The cruise control was on. All she had to do was steer, keep her eyes on the road, and drive a few more minutes. But in the blink of an eye, they were plunging toward disaster. I dozed off at the wheel. I fell asleep. As soon as the wheels left the road, I woke with a start and thought, got to get the car stopped. Things were so fast. They hit the guardrail, then catapulted into the air and headed down a ravine with her six children strapped in their seats. We flew through the air, and as we were flying, I saw water, and I was unlocking the doors and undoing my seatbelt so we could get in and get the kids, and as soon as we hit the water, instantly, the water and the current and all that pressure, the windshield broke. It was so disorienting and so fast and powerful, the water actually pushed me through that into the back seat. Our son Matthew, who had just turned two, was in his car seat, and he reached out and grabbed my arm, unbuckled his car seat and got him out, and, and then I couldn't get the door open, and I, I thought in my mind, Richard's going to lose his whole family. I thought, I thought he was going to lose everyone. I was able finally to get the door open against the current, which I think in itself was a miracle and was able to get out with Matthew. And I was just screaming, there are five more babies in the car. There's five more babies. After watching an excruciating 20 minutes of frantic work, rescuers reached the two oldest children, Ryan and Julie. And they weren't immediately conscious, but you could see they were alive. It was like getting two back that I was sure were dead. But three other children died. I can remember looking up at where my car had come from and saying, I killed my children. At the hospital, the phone call was placed to Teresa's husband. And I had to tell him that his beautiful little Katie with her blue eyes and blonde hair was gone. <laughs> and Jonathan with his big brown eyes was gone. And Jacob, our little baby, was gone. All Richard said was, are you OK? My husband kept telling me, there's nothing to be forgiven for. It's just an accident. If I had placed judgment at all, I think it would have just destroyed her. I think that a huge part of my healing was being able to accept my own humanness, that I'm prone to mistakes, just like every other person that walks on the earth. We had a wonderful friend speak at our children's funeral. He said, you could kill yourself if you kept asking, what if? He said, instead, you have to ask, so now what? And we did. When time passed and I started to forget, that was another point of guilt. Dear Katie, I remember so well the way you did. A friend gave them a family journal so they could write down memories of Jonathan, Katie, and Jacob. Weren't we having a good time? Do you remember? 
it was very therapeutic and very healing. And it's not that we forget them or that they're any less part of our family, but just that we can go on and to have new experiences and that those can be good. What now? We'll talk to Teresa when we come back. So we just heard Teresa's story of an accident that resulted in the death of three of her children and how she managed to begin the process of forgiving herself. I think you just reiterated what uh, Rabbi Kula had said, which I think is very powerful, powerful, what someone read at your children's funeral. So what now? Because you can spend your lifetime going, what if? How long of a process, did, how long did it take you to begin to get to that? We started it right away. Really? But being able to feel effects from it mm -hmm. took a long time. Mm -hmm. Starting each day, waking up, and feeling like, is this still real? This is still this nightmare we're in. Mm -hmm. But instead thinking, okay, this is real. This is life. Mm -hmm. This is where we are right now. And now what? What do I do with this day? What choices do I make? And I think it's partly having a lot of faith mm -hmm. and a lot of hope that that dark place we were in was not where we had to stay. Forever, yeah. Th that's where that's we were. That's what faith is, isn't it? Ultimately, yeah. it's knowing that I'm here now, but I don't have to always be here. And knowing that um, while we were in that dark place and hurting so badly, we felt a lot of love from God, mm -hmm. you know, just filling us mm -hmm. and feeling very strong and intense. Mm -hmm. And knowing that... Um, People would say, oh, you'll get to be with your kids again someday. And we have a lot of faith that that's true, that mm -hmm. we'll be with them again and that they're still our children. Mm -hmm. And But knowing that with the Lord's love, he doesn't want us to only have happiness in the next life. Mm -hmm. That we, he wants us happy now. There's a, there's a way to be happy in this life. And while things can never go back how they were, we'll never have six little tiny children again. We'll, we'll never have those little ones back here that we can go on and make a new normal mm -hmm. that there's mm. a new life and a new things that we can do um, do you think that uh because i was saying this was christy's only son so do you think that part of it for you was i i i've talked to other people who say this who had other children saying having to let the other people in the family grieve as they knew how to grieve and having to carry on too because you still have other children that was that was very hard, having to be. It was hard and it was good. We were glad we still had three, and we've had three more since. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but knowing, uh, it was hard to grieve and function. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is hard. Mm -hmm. You know that no matter how it is you function, it's hard to get up, and and act. But knowing again, that there is a way, and just with each passing day. You, I, I think part of it, too, is for me, I knew who I was based on my circumstances. I had six children. I would project myself 20 years down the road and see who I was going to be and how things were. And having this happen felt like having my life's rug pulled out from under me mm -hmm. and my whole identity pulled away. Mm -hmm. And starting over with that, coming back to who am I? Who is Teresa? I'm a daughter of God. I am me. What values do I have? What feelings do I have? I'm Richard's wife. That we have wonderful things that, that can happen, but it was a whole building process. Yeah, I thought it was beautiful, the fact that Richard said he knew that he could never judge because you knew that to judge would have destroyed. killed her, would have destroyed her. Yeah. And I've heard that you've always in the family told the children how much you love their mother, and this was a way of demonstrating that love for her. Yeah, I feel like... You know, that's one of the most important things I can do is tell my children and show them in everything I do that I love their mom, that she's my sweetheart, and that will never change. Oh, the women went, oh! <laughs> we'll be right back. We'll be right back. Oh, my God!
Well, I want to say, you know, we've been doing a lot of shows about romantic love and people finding the illusion and women come on here talking about they want their husbands to bring them <laughs> roses and champagne and they think the marriage. That is the real deal. That is the real deal. That's better than... <laughs> That's what you want. That is what you want. That, what did you want to say? I, I think there were, I mean, I think there were so many things that Teresa brings to, to this conversation that, that should be brought out even more. One is that, that forgiveness is not forgetting. And I think that there's a confusion there that we think when we forgive ourselves, well, then we forget it and we're happy and everything's fine. And, and that's not the case. What forgiveness is, it, it transcends the event, but includes it also. And that's a really hard thing to learn that, that, that I think Teresa's right on about. The second, and this is the issue of, of faith, is whether there's, a, whether there's a faith in a God outside or a God inside, what, what, what you're saying and what's really important is that you can't forgive yourself until you find yourself, because it's yourself that has to forgive you. Mm -hmm. And if what you are is guilty, if that's how you see yourself, then there's no self that's going to forgive. So in some respects, you have to enter that feeling of guilt, not resist it. You have to enter it, and you have to kind of, it's almost like there's a message from that guilt. But once you're there and observing the guilt, you're not the guilt. Once you're observing the mistake or the failure, even a terrible, tragic failure, you're not that failure. You're yeah. not that tragedy. There's you, a you yeah. that's witnessing that. That's really good, because you realize that that is not who you are. That's what, that is something that happened. And that's how you know you're loved. That's exactly how, when you said, I know I'm still loved by God, it's because that I is not the, per is not the mistake. You're not the mistake. Yes, you made a terrible, tragic mistake, but you're not a tragic, you are not a tragic mistake. You had a terrible failure, and we shouldn't, and we don't make light of it. People who make light of it, probably it's not helpful at all, you know, when... when but you are not the tragic. But you are not a failure. Okay. And there's a difference. Feeling trapped in a web of guilt and not being able to forgive yourself is something that Jennifer, too, has lived with for the past uh, five years. Listen to Jennifer's story. I was 22 years old. I came home early and went to bed, and around 3 o'clock in the morning, heard a sound like feet shuffling and said, who's there? And a man jumped on my bed and pinned my hands beside my head and put a knife to my throat. And I screamed, and he told me to shut up or he would kill me. And so I realized that he was going to rape me. My first instinct was, if I live, if I survive, I want to nail this person. I want to see him spend the rest of his life and rot in prison. And I began to study his face and began to look for any identifying feature. After several hours of being raped and brutalized, Jennifer was finally able to escape. When I went to the police station, the first thing I did was um, try to put together a composite drawing. That drawing ran in the newspaper the very next day, and Ronald Cotton, a young man who happened to live nearby, came home to startling news. Someone called in and stated that I resembled the drawing of the suspect. So Ronald voluntarily went to the police department to declare his innocence. But after an intense interrogation, Ron remained a suspect. I had the opportunity to view a lineup of six African-American men. I wrote down Ronald Cotton's number because he looked like the man who raped me. I wanted him behind bars worse than anything ever. I wanted him to pay. I wanted him to pay with his life, his soul, everything. I hated him. I hated Ronald Cotton more than I hated anybody on this planet. And Jennifer displayed that intense emotion and raw determination while on the witness stand. Her compelling testimony sealed Ron's fate. I was given life in 54 years. It was like hell for me. I was crying on the inside. When he was given a sentence and the trial was over, I felt like justice had been served. But after 11 long years of Ronald living behind a prison wall, Jennifer learned that Ronald had actually been served the ultimate injustice, that he'd been telling the truth, and that she had accused and convicted the wrong man. So, after Ronald Cotton spent 11 years in prison, a DNA test proved that he was not the man who raped Jennifer. She says she is now consumed with guilt over sending the wrong man to prison and cannot forgive herself how do you feel seeing that piece um like i've just relived it all over again mm -hmm. 
You know, sometimes when I think about 11 years, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's a very quick thing to say 11 years, mm -hmm. but the other day I broke it down and I realized he'd spent 4,200 days mm -hmm. behind bars. Mm -hmm. And knowing that all that time, you know, I hated him and I filled my life with hate and wanting revenge and fear and, um, and then had been misplaced. Um, have you met him? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron and I um, actually have become extraordinarily close friends. Mm -hmm. And he has forgiven you? Yes, he has. I, uh, in 1997, um, I had lived with it for about two years knowing that he had been innocent and um, trying to justify it and trying to kind of squash it down in, inside. I needed to take that next step, and so I asked if I could meet with him. Mm -hmm. And a meeting was arranged for Ron and I to come together for the first time outside of a courtroom. Mm -hmm. And he sat with me, and I looked him in the eyes, and I said, Ron, if I spent every day of the rest of my life trying to tell you how sorry I am, it just it wouldn't come close to how I feel. And Ron looked at me, and his wife looked at me, and they said, we forgive you that I'm not angry at you, and I've never been angry at you, and I just want you to be happy, and I want to be happy, and I want us to have good lives. And it was at that moment I realized that, um, that hate and anger had separated me, had fractured me, had continued to make me feel broken. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was interesting when you said that uh, even during the process of this horrifying, you know, r rape, that you were... <laughs> You're studying his face, and you were consumed with the idea of that I am going to get revenge. I thought that was interesting because most people consume with the idea of let me save myself, be alive. Let, let me be alive, let me be. So that became your passion. I'm going to get even with whoever it was that, that did this to me. And you felt obviously certain when you picked his number in the lineup that it was. I was absolutely certain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely certain. So you... There wasn't a doubt. Mm -hmm. So, so. Mistakes really do happen in judgments. You mistakes know, mistakes really, do, really happen. do happen in judgments. You have children? I have triplets. You have, you have triplets. Mm -hmm. when, you, and when you're raising your children, they make mistakes? They make mistakes a lot. <laughs> yeah. You're teaching them how to, uh, to live with those mistakes? You know, it's, I, I, I teach them how to live with mistakes. I teach them how to forgive themselves. I teach them how to say I'm sorry. It's just not something that I can do for me. It's just so hard for me to separate and say, Jennifer, you made a mistake and you're okay and you're a good person, because I, I set such high expectations. Because it's for four thousand days on somebody else's life. Right. Yeah, right. I know what he missed, and I can't change that, and I can't give that back to him, and it it um, suffocates me. You say she's paralyzed by the fear of making another mistake, because I, I I've heard that you've turned into a perfectionist over this. I am so driven all the time. To, do, to make no mistakes, to do nothing wrong, to be perfect all the time. And to never stop. Like, I never stop and sit and get quiet because I'm afraid of that space. So you know exactly what you need to do. You just, you just said exactly what you need to do. But you I'm need afraid. to sit and be quiet and to allow that feeling, to own that feeling of the guilt of making But a she's mistake. afraid. That's what you have to fight. Do it you anyway. You just got to do it. That's you got to say, is. 8 o'clock in the morning when you get up or when those, how old are the kids? They're 10. 10. So when they're out to school, right, you have to take 10 minutes every single day. See, it used to be a time when we had rituals to help us do this. And maybe we'll talk about that when, when, when we come no, back. We no, we won't. We're going to remit. Okay. We won't no, talk okay. about that. Well, <laughs> we Rabbi, won't. this is TV. We're live. <laughs> We're out of time. We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We'll, we'll be back in a moment. In today's Remembering Your Spirit, we asked Gary Zukov to share his insight on forgiveness. Take a look. Forgiveness is an energy dynamic. It is not something that you have to do. It is a choice. And like every choice, it creates consequences. When you do not forgive, it is like wearing sunglasses that are dark and gruesomely distort everything that you see. When you forgive, you take off the glasses. When you do not forgive, it's like carrying heavy baggage wherever you go. When you forgive, you put the baggage down and you walk away without it. You travel more lightly. Whether you're forgiving yourself 
or you're forgiving another person, the dynamic is the same. If you choose not to forgive yourself because you feel that you are not worthy of forgiving or that what you have done is unforgivable, understand that the universe does not condemn and it does not judge. Your job is not to punish others and it is not to punish yourself. It is to learn through your experiences. If you choose to continue to punish yourself for something that you think you should not have done, you are not able to learn from that. You stay stuck where you were. You cannot go forward. You cannot give the gifts that your soul wants you to give. Forgiving yourself or forgiving another person is not letting another person or yourself off the hook. It is making a choice to move forward in your life, to move forward with the benefit of what you have learned from what you have experienced. How can you become a compassionate and kind person when you hate yourself? How can you become compassionate when you cannot forgive yourself? Forgiving and forgetting are not the same thing. If you have had an experience in which you feel guilty, I am suggesting that you experiment with moving on with your life. And in order to do that in a full and powerful way, you need to forgive. When you choose not to forgive yourself, you bring into your experience guilt and shame. There are no positive attributes of guilt or shame. I am suggesting that you put down your excess baggage and focus your attention where it can produce positive results both in you and in the world. If you choose to forgive, you choose to leave behind the burden of guilt and remorse. It is a choice that you make either to keep the burden or to release the burden. The choice is yours. I want to say thanks to everybody for sharing your stories, how powerful it is that you had the courage to come on here, Kim and Teresa and Christy. And I wanted to say to those of you who live in Kansas City, Missouri, this case, Christy's son, Jake, uh, the man comes to trial, Kim Davis, in uh, Kansas City sometime this spring. I think it is the responsibility of the citizens of Jackson County to make sure that true justice is served in this case. This is not a case where we want plea bargain. Anything less than first degree murder in this case would be an insult to the children of this nation. So I'm, I'm telling you all that so that when the case comes to trial, Kansas City, Jackson County, you know what to do. Thank you. Guests fly our official carrier, American Airlines. American and American Eagle provide service to dozens of warm destinations in Florida, Mexico, the Bahamas, and the Caribbean. American Airlines, something special to the sun. Hi, YouTubers. I'm excited to give you an update about our own YouTube channel. Now you can find new videos every day. They're the kind of videos that will make you look at life differently. They may even make you laugh a little bit. Subscribe to the OWN channel today, and we'll see you on YouTube.